Luke Stein here with a brief introduction to the math behind return and risk in finance. We've said that investors look for three things to make an investment attractive. One, it should deliver large payouts. Two, those payouts will hopefully come soon. And three, they should be relatively safe. That is to say, investors should be able to predict those payouts with high confidence, and the investment should therefore uh, be low risk. The trade-off between the first two, large payoffs and payoffs that come soon, is captured in the mathematical tools we called the time value of money. This short video is going to introduce a way of using those same mathematical tools, our TVM tools or discounting, in order to incorporate the risk and return trade-off. So discounting provided a valuable framework for valuing assets, in particular through the DCF or discounted cash flow technique, where a discount rate showed up in the denominator of all of those calculations. We always said that the present value equaled some function of future cash flows and a discount rate. And we described that discount rate as the appropriate risk-adjusted discount rate, designed to capture both the fact that investors don't like waiting, that is the time value of money, but also the possibility that expected future payouts may not actually materialize. Of course, the payouts may be better than expected, um, but they might be worse. And so th to the degree that investors expect uh, higher levels of risk in anticipated future payoffs, we're going to introduce uh, an, a higher value of the discount rate designed to capture the fact that investors require higher rates of return as compensation for risk in those future payoffs. And of course, since the discount rate shows up in the denominator of all of our discounting calculations, that higher expected or required rate of return is also going to show up as a lower price or value for investments uh, today that deliver riskier payoffs in the future. So how's that going to work out? Well, we know that capital providers should be willing to pay less or equivalently require higher rates of return on investments that they consider riskier. And therefore, there are a variety of ways that we could try to include risk in our valuation models. We're going to introduce one, which is that higher risk is going to show up as an elevated discount rate. So by increasing the discount rate, we're going to capture both um, impatience, the pure time value of money, and investors' risk aversion. That higher discount rate is going to show up as lower asset prices um, and higher rates of return. Those two things always go hand in hand. If you pay less for any investment that delivers the same future payoffs, by paying less, you should be able to receive higher rates of return on your investment. So at this point, the math behind that is going to look extremely simple. We're just going to say that the discount rate we use to value any financial asset should capture not only the time value of money, which we'll call the risk-free rate, the rate of return that an investor would require on a risk-free investment, that is to say compensation for the fact that she's impatient and she would rather get paid sooner rather than later, but we're going to increase that discount rate by some amount called a risk premium. What exactly drives that risk premium is going to depend on exactly what type of financial asset we're talking about. Um, and so we'll have more to say specifically for bonds and for stocks. For bonds, the major source of risk is going to be associated with the possibility of default, uh, non-payment of, of expected or promised future payments, although that's not actually going to be the only source of risk for bonds. But if we think about default as being the major driver um, of risk for a lender or for a bondholder, um, riskier bonds, those that have higher probability of default, all else equal should be associated with higher risk premia, therefore higher discount rates, and therefore lower bond prices and higher bond yields. For stocks, this is going to require a little bit more nuance uh, and a little bit of a richer set of tools. So the two key questions that we're going to need to ask in order to figure out how to apply this discounting-based uh, math uh, behind the risk and return trade-off, that is to say, how much should we increase the discount rate to account for a relevant risk premium is really going to require us to answer two questions. The first is, how does a capital provider measure the risk associated with a given investment? And then secondly, how do we estimate not only the relevant risk-free rate that's going to serve as a baseline, but also the risk premium that a capital provider is going to require given the way that they measured risk, the, the answer that we gave to that first question. So, um, just as a preview, we're going to have more detail on this, but let me try to describe to you how we're going to do this uh, on the debt side and on the equity side. So, for debt, the cost of debt, and I should be clear, this is the cost paid by the borrower or by the bond issuer, 
um, the return that's received by bondholders or lenders is paid by the borrower or the bond issuer. And so, whereas on the last slide, I called this the discount rate that drives uh, the investor or the lender's valuation, we can also think about this as the cost that's paid in order to get access to those funds by whatever company does the issue. The cost of debt, which on a loan is typically going to be associated with the interest rate on that loan, on a bond, it's going to be associated with the yield to maturity on that bond, is going to come, as we noted on the previous slide, from the relevant risk-free rate and from a risk premium, which in the course of bonds, we're going to call the credit spread on those bonds, on that bond. So the relevant risk-free rate on a bond we'll typically think of as being what kind of rate of return a lender could get if they made a risk-free loan of the same duration. So what that's going to mean is on a five-year bond, we're going to look for a five-year risk-free benchmark. On a 10-year bond, we're going to look for a 10-year risk-free benchmark. What about the credit spread? Well, the credit spread is going to be the additional rate of return that bond investors require as compensation for taking on risk associated with a risky bond or a risky loan rather than a risk-free one. And given that the major source of risk, not the only source, but the major source of risk on bonds is going to be um, default risk, the possibility of non-payment, uh, this risk premium is largely going to be a function of a bond's credit rating. More to come about what those credit ratings are. On the equity side, we're going to wind up describing the relevant cost of equity as, again, starting with a relevant risk-free benchmark, where that risk-free benchmark is going to be associated with the duration of the equity investment. A little bit subtler there. I know that a five-year bond is a five-year investment. I know that a 10-year bond is a 10-year investment. It's not really clear to me how I should think about the lifetime of an equity investment. Um, to that, we're going to add, as always, a risk premium, where the key model that we're going to use to describe equity risk premiums is going to be a model called the capital asset pricing model or the CAPM, C-A-P-M model. And that risk premium is going to be estimated as the product or the multiplication of two things. One is going to be a measure called beta, which is going to be a measure of the amount of investment specific risk in a given investment. And that amount of investment specific risk is going to be measured using linear regression uh, and is going to be based on the amount of co-movement that a given stock has with the market as a whole. The second component that beta is going to multiply is something called the market risk premium. So again, a risk premium tells us how much extra compensation investors require in order to make a risky investment. The market risk premium is going to be the risk premium on the stock market. How much extra compensation does an investor require in order to hold an investment which is as risky as investing in the broad aggregate stock market? And we can do that by subtracting off the risk-free benchmark rate from investors' expected return on the market. So we may be trying to figure out the risk premium on a given equity, on a share of Tesla or a share of GameStop or a share of, of Intel. Um, but in order to do that, we're going to try to understand what's the risk premium not only on those individual stocks, but on the stock market as a whole. How much do investors require as compensation to invest in the stock market collectively? Well, we can subtract off the amount that they um, could earn on a risk-free investment from what they expect to earn when they invest in the market as a whole. And that difference called the market risk premium is going to tell us, in a sense, about the, the price of risk. So you can think about beta as a measure of the quantity of risk and the market risk premium as a measure of the price of risk. One last thought before we dive into the specifics on debt and equity. Um, you may have noticed that a variety of terms are already looking like they have some connection to each other. So I talked about the discount rate. That was to say the higher rate of return that investors used when they valued an asset. But then I started talking about the cost of debt and the cost of equity. It turns out that under a set of common assumptions, assumptions that we'll often make, although they may not actually hold, many conceptually distinct values turn out to be equal to each other. So the discount rate is going to be the rate of return that investors use when they engage in discounting in order to, um, to value a financial asset. Um, and that's going to be associated, of course, with the price or the return that the issuer, the borrower, has to pay in order to convince anyone to invest in its investments, to, to invest in its securities. Well, how do investors think about what discount rate to apply? Well, one thing they might do is compare a given investment to 
other alternative investments that they might make, and in particular, other alternative investments that they might make that seem somehow similarly risky. So if I didn't invest in this bond, if I didn't invest in this stock, what else might I do with my money, and what rate of return could I earn on those investments? And so in that sense, the discount rate that investors apply should be their opportunity cost. That is to say, the rate of return that they could earn elsewhere on a similarly risky investment. So if they're going to be willing to make this investment, it must be that this investment delivers an expected rate of return at least as high as their opportunity cost. So we know that the expected return has to be at least as high as investors' opportunity cost in order to attract any investors. And it turns out that as long as there are many investors competing to buy up the best possible investments, there's no reason that an issuer of a security should offer Uh, an expected return higher than the opportunity cost, well, if the buyers of the security require that the expected return be at least as high as the opportunity cost, and the issuers have a variety of potential investors to to select from and aren't going to offer a return lower than the opportunity cost, then in a competitive market, that expected rate of return should exactly equal the opportunity cost or required rate of return that investors apply. So we often wind up also calling this investor's required rate of return. I'm going to require that this investment offer uh, a return as good as my best alternative or opportunity cost. Um, And once we introduce capital budgeting, you'll see that we're also going to associate this discount rate with a concept called the hurdle rate. Um, And that has to do with the fact that when a firm raises funds by issuing financial securities, say by borrowing, by selling stocks, uh, by selling bonds, um, it's only going to want to do that if it can find projects to invest in that deliver returns at least as high as that discount rate. And so on the capital provision side, um, the discount rate is going to be associated Um, with the rate that investors charge, demand, or require um, from the firm. But the firm is then going to make sure that it has opportunities to grow those funds in the course of its business by investing in projects that can deliver returns that are at least that high. 